Okay, we're right at two o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's OBSSR Director's Webinar Series. Presentation today is on violence as a public health problem, what we know, and where we're going. I'm Wendy Smith. I'm the Associate Director of OBSSR at the National Institutes of Health. Before I introduce our amazing speaker today, we have a few housekeeping items to mention. The webinar is being report, recorded and the recording will be available in about one month on our website at obssr.od.nih.gov. Today's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. All attendees are muted during the webinar itself but, and the chat feature is disabled, but questions and comments will be taken via the Zoom Q&A feature. To ask a question or send a comment, click on the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, type in your question and send. You'll also have an option to hit like for other questions so there's fewer duplicate posts. The most like questions automatically move up to the top. Feel free to send a question at any time during the webinar. Following the presentation, NICHD's Dr. Leila Esposito will facilitate our question and answer session and we'll be asking your questions to our presenter. So I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Megan L. Rani. Dr. Rani is a practicing emergency physician, researcher, and national advocate for innovative approaches to public health. She's currently the Deputy Dean at Brown University School of Public Health, the Warren Albert Endowed Professor of Emergency Medicine at the Albert Medical School of Brown University, and the founding director of the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health. In July 2023, she will become the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Rani's research focuses on developing, testing, and disseminating digital health inter interventions to prevent violence and related behavioral health problems, and on COVID-related risk reduction. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Rani has held multiple national leadership roles, including co-founder and senior strategic advisor for Affirm at the Aspen Institute, focused on ending gun violence through nonpartisan public health approaches. She's a frequent media contributor to outlets ranging from CNN and CBS to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. She earned her bachelor's degree in history of science, graduating summa cum laude from Harvard University, her medical doctorate graduating Alpha Omega Alpha from Columbia University, and her master's degree in public health from Brown University. She completed her residency in emergency medicine and a fellowship in injury prevention research, also at Brown. It is truly my pleasure to welcome Dr. Rani to present today on violence as a public health problem, what we know and where we're going. Dr. Rani. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. It's an honor and privilege to join you all today, um, as well as all of those who are on the webinar. Uh, so without further ado, I will of course start with disclosures. Um, I do have NIH and CDC research support, and I serve in an advisory role to multiple organizations, um, but have no fiduciary conflicts with any of the things that I'll be talking about today. So as I talk about violence as a public health problem, I need to start by acknowledging that it feels like we are surrounded by stories about violence, mental illness, misinformation, and of course, firearm injury every day. Um, today alone, I've had two stories pop up on my uh, news feed um, about new um, so-called newsworthy shootings. Um, I'm a parent of a 14-year-old girl um, and being both in the public health field and an emergency physician, it feels like we're surrounded with this. Indeed, as an emergency physician, I take care of victims of violence pretty much every day um, on every shift in the emergency department and have since day one. But I also, in the emergency department, take care of folks for whom the violence may not be obvious, may not be that they're coming in as a direct uh, gun with a gunshot wound or a stabbing, um, but rather they have been the victim of partner violence, which is what led to the problem that brought them there or they have a history of adverse childhood experiences, which led to their depression or anxiety or their inability to manage their medical problems on an ongoing basis. And as a healthcare provider, I'm also deeply aware of the ways in which our country's epidemic of violence affects us as humans. 
um, for myself, part of the reason why I do this work and focus on this area of research is because of both personal experiences I've had and folks who I've treated in my emergency department who have stayed with me. I know that's true for many of my colleagues um, and for many of my fellow researchers in the violence prevention space. These all serve as motivating forces um, for the work that I'm going to talk about today. So as we start with thinking about that barrage of media information that we are exposed to every day, it is inevitable that we feel a bit hopeless. Um, but the focus of my talk today is going to be around how the public health approach can provide us hope. I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about what that public health approach means. Um, it won't be surprising to many of you who are on the webinar um, coming from the behavioral and social science space. I'm then going to talk a little bit about the facts about why I call this an epidemic or syndemic, um, about what the data tells us. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the interventions that I and my colleagues are testing, as well as some of the exciting work that's going on in the field um, afar from my own work. So the public health approach um, is really a four-step approach, as you're all aware. The first step is to gather data to measure incidence, prevalence, um, to look at uh, local concentrations of uh, a problem. Second, to identify risk and protective factors. Third, to develop and evaluate interventions. And finally, to implement what works. Within the public health approach, we use multiple theoretical models, but one of the most common ones, specifically for the field of injury prevent, or particularly for the field of injury prevention, is the social ecological model. It's the idea that although we can measure prevalence, risk and protective factors, develop um, interventions and implement on an individual level, which of course is so much of what the healthcare field does, we also need to take into account the larger ecology in which a person lives. So it's about their individual circumstances and risk and protective factors. It's also about their relationship or families, their community or neighborhood, and the larger society in which they live. When we apply this four-step public health approach, when we apply theoretical models such as the social ecological model, and there are obviously lots of others as well, it works. Um, this is a graph that I love to show uh, with the yellow line representing car crash deaths um, is a rate per 100,000 over time, the blue line representing deaths from HIV AIDS, and the red line representing deaths from firearms. We know that we've successfully decreased car crash deaths by more than 70% since their peak in the 1970s, uh, despite there being more cars on the road, more millions of miles traveled, um, Per person than ever before um, by applying this four-step approach. We measured who was getting hurt, where, and why. We examined risk and protective factors, found out that things like drunk driving increased your risk of a crash or that certain intersections were higher risk. We then developed and implemented interventions, including engineering interventions, putting in place three-point seat, three seatbelts, putting in airbags, changing the structure of roads, putting in policies such as banning drunk driving and, or, and, and, and then enforcing those policies and legislation and using educational interventions such as, for example, now you can't leave my hospital with a newborn baby if you don't have a car seat properly installed. We also put together societal interventions, things like creating the um, ATLS, which helps us take better care of acutely injured patients and creating trauma systems that let us get folks to care in a timely manner. It was that combination of reduction uh, of interventions and that harm reduction approach that helped us make that tremendous progress on car crashes. Similarly, going more in the behavioral and social science field, if we talk about HIV AIDS, obviously we didn't know it existed prior to the late 70s, early 80s. We saw death spike um, by the mid 90s. And then we've since seen about a 90% decrease in death rates from HIV through the combination of that four-step approach. Basic science, the discovery of highly, anti, uh, highly active antiretrovirals was obviously a big part of that success. But the discovery of a pharmaceutical compound in and of itself is not what allowed us to make this progress against HIV and AIDS. It was also the dissemination and the work with communities to increase acceptability and adherence to antiretrovirals. It was also around risk reduction and harm reduction measures, whether it's passing out 
um, syringes and having um, uh, kind of safe drug use counseling for folks with substance use disorder, whether it's safe sex counseling and making condoms easily available. We know that an abstinence only approach does not work for HIV AIDS, but rather again, we have to take that full social ecological continuum into account. And through those multimodal uh, interventions, again, we've succeeded in decreasing the death rate. I, I think that the work um, that has been done uh, on HIV AIDS is really one of the great public health successes um, of the last 50 years. And then I have the red line, which is firearm deaths. I could just as easily have put violence in general here, um, but I put firearms up because I think it's important for us to realize that we did have um, an all-time high of firearm deaths in the 80s to kind of early 90s, which our country has not yet quite hit again. Um, but from about uh, 2004, 2005 onwards, we've had an inexorable increase in the number of firearm deaths each year. Um, and, and currently our rate is at the highest that it's been since that peak um, in the early 90s. The reason I would posit, and as I will talk about over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, um, that we've not seen success is because we really have not applied that public health approach for a variety of reasons, including politicization, um, lack of funding, um, the, so the Dickey Amendment, which, although it didn't officially ban funding to CDC and NIH, effectively meant that we did not have formal appropriations for work on firearm injury prevention. And most of all, again, this lack of realization that violence is inherently a public health problem. It is not just a criminal justice problem. Um, it is not just a legislative problem, just like HIV, just like car crashes, just like diabetes. We can only manage to make success if we do apply this full um, public health approach. Now, we are, of course, right now in the United States in the midst of a number of overlapping epidemics or syndemics, um, and again, knowing this audience is one that is more probably science-based um, than many that I speak to, I still think it's worth starting with the official definition of an epidemic, which is that it is the occurrence of more cases of disease than expected in a given area or among a specific group of people over a particular period of time. Violence and firearm injury in particular certainly meets this definition. Um, this graph, I have the age in, uh, or excuse me, the year in, on the x-axis, uh, death rates corrected for population, so per 100,000 on the y-axis. And you can see again uh, that our death rates um, from firearm suicide started to increase around 2005, 2006. Homicide rates bumped up and down, but started to increase, firearm homicides started to increase significantly around 2014 with a major spike during the COVID pandemic, and unintentional firearm death rates have stayed relatively stable um, over time, over the last two decades. So clearly rates are increasing. This slide shows the rates among children um, in the United States. We know that rates of firearm death for children have now overtaken motor vehicle crashes, which were for a very long time the leading cause of childhood death. Um, and this, this slide shows why. And we've seen this dramatic increase in youth firearm homicide deaths over the past five years, and this preceded COVID. Similarly, we've seen a dramatic increase in youth suicide deaths um, with a firearm over the past five years or so. And we started to see an increase in unintentional firearm deaths as well. So this is an epidemic that is affecting specific populations, particularly kids. And it's an epidemic that concentrates geogra geographically. Um, there's lots of talk about uh, firearm violence in urban areas, and I'll talk a little bit about that further along in this talk. But I think it's worth calling out that it's actually something that affects every one of us, regardless of where we live. And actually, the states and counties with the highest firearm death rates are, by and large, rural. Uh, so as of the last year for, in which we have full um, vital statistics data, um, firearm mortality rates were highest in Wyoming, Missouri, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, with Arkansas close, or excuse me, with um, uh, Alaska close behind. This largely represents firearm suicide, but firearm homicide, particularly intimate partner homicide, is also quite common. And when you look on a county by county basis, rural counties actually have higher firearm death rates than urban counties. So as an epidemic, it does concentrate, but not always in the ways that the media portrays it. Now, I said earlier that this is a syndemic problem. 
And I'm going to make the argument that we cannot separate out our country's epidemic of violence, particularly firearm violence, from the other epidemics that are also occurring. I'm not going to go into details, but we all know that our country is experiencing ever increasing rates of substance abuse um, and drug involved overdose deaths with a particular rise in synthetic opioid deaths, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs um, over the last five years or so. This is very real. Um, it uh, concentrates again in certain populations. I have colleagues um, both at Brown and elsewhere that are spending a lot of their research time looking at identifying those hot spots and those characteristics. But it is an epidemic that deserves just as much attention um, as our epidemic of violence. And again, often intersects. When we look at that huge increase, kind of those 15 years or so of high firearm um, death rates in the United States in the 80s and 90s, that was deeply tied to the ongoing crack cocaine epidemic at that time. And many of us are now looking at the ways in which um, violence and the current substance use disorder uh, epidemic, current overdose epidemic is overlapping. We also know, as we're talking about syndemics, that we're seeing increasing rates of mental health disorders. Now, I don't mean to kind of, again, subscribe to the media narrative of, oh my gosh, COVID caused um, a mental health epidemic among our children. Um, but this uh, graph, which is adapted actually from a White House chart, um, shows the degree to which we have seen a significant increase in the percent of our young, of our youth and young adults um, who self-identify as having depressive disorders uh, over the past 15 years or so with some increase in those age 26 plus. Um, worth mentioning here, of course, um, we're more likely to see, whereas violence is most common among men, um, and we see disproportionate impact of violence and firearm violence among minoritized populations, particularly black and brown men, who are 20 times more likely to be a victim of firearm homicide, and among um, American Indian or Alaskan Native men, who are significantly more likely to uh, take their own lives for firearm suicide. When we look at depressive disorders and mental health problems, those are much more likely to be reported among women and um, uh, adolescent girls. We also know that depressive disorders are more common among um, people who identify as LGBTQ plus as well. So there are slightly different risk factors when we talk about um, mental illness than there is when we talk about violence. Um, Overdose death, uh, for better or for worse right now, um, knows no boundaries um, and, and both, uh, we have slightly different patterns of death, um, but uh, those risk factors are a little less clear. As I talk about mental health problems in the United States and, and that so-called epidemic of mental health problems among youth um, have been NICHD funded for a very long time. I think some of you on this uh, webinar probably have as well. And we know that this is a problem that predated COVID. In spite of the media coverage of mental health and suicide being a dramatically increased problem during COVID, um, this graph that just came out in MMWR last week looks at not percentage of emergency department visits that are due to mental health um, overdose um, and suicide attempt. Top is mental health, middle is suicide attempt, bottom, that little dotted line is overdose, but looks at the absolute number of weekly emergency department visits for age 12 through 17. And you can see that where we were, this goes through kind of fall of 2022, early 2023, um, our, our actual number of mental health visits is actually quite similar pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Trouble, of course, is we don't have anywhere to put these children who desperately need help. We don't have adequate resources for them. And so they end up spending lots of time in the emergency department, which I'll talk about further. Finally, as I talk about syndemics, I would be remiss to not mention social media. 95% um, of American youth report that they use social media. Around 80% of American adults report that they see, use social media. Of course, seen a dramatic increase in rates of social media use over that same period of time that we've seen an increase in mental health problems, an increase in violence. It is only natural to assume that it is social media that has led to or exacerbated those other problems. Um, these two graphs come from Pew, which is one of my favorite sources um, of national social media use data. Um, in terms of that association between social media and mental illness or between social media and violence, there is lots and lots of debate out there. Um, this is a paper that came out relatively recently 
um, looking at the association between Facebook use at different colleges and mental health problems, suggesting that there actually was a direct correlation between the deployment of Facebook and mental health problems among college students. But uh, if you actually do a survey of the entire field, the relationship is far from settled. There's a lot of debate over passive versus active social media use. Um, we know that social media can be a lifeline, particularly again for sexual and gender minority youth, um, for folks who don't have communities in um, rural or otherwise isolated communities. Um, and we know that there are some aspects of social media use that can actually be quite beneficial. So with that overview of the facts, let me now lead into kind of the, the very high level overview. Um, let me lead into a little bit more about the developing and evaluation of interventions. Here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own research um, and then I'll lead, uh, I'll close with a bit more about others work. So as an emergency physician, I, as well as a researcher, I've gathered the data, identified in um, both those risk and some of those protective factors. And then because I personally don't love to just stand by and watch things happen and to watch people fill my emergency department, um, where I've really focused most of my own work is around that development and evaluation of interventions with the recognition that it is very difficult to disentangle violence from those other syndemics that are ongoing, much less to disentangle violence on the individual level from that larger family, community, societal level. And so as I start talking through these various programs that I'm testing or trying, you'll see that although I have a specific individual focus for many of them, it also kind of takes a slightly wider lens. So the first project um, is labeled IDOV2, which is a technology augmented intervention to prevent peer violence and depressive symptoms among at-risk emergency department adolescents. I'm grateful to NICHD for the funding on this study. The underlying kind of concept behind the study is that as we've just talked about, there are both external and internal um, factors that increase risk potentially um, of uh, the individual level circumstances that lead to both physical peer violence and depressive symptoms. Poor cognitive reappraisal skills, poor emotional regulation skills, poor conflict resolution skills, low self-efficacy, all are known to correlate both with mental health problems and with likelihood of physical violence. Moreover, the violence then gets into this kind of loop with depressive symptoms and vice versa. Both, if they're not um, uh, kind of, uh, intervened with, can lead to lots of long-term consequences, including recurrent violence, substance use disorder, and so on. At the time when I conceived of this study, social media use was a thing, but not as big as it is now, so we didn't have this in the model. But we did start by using technology to try to deliver interventions. We know that about 40% of kids who come through the emergency department for any reason, for a headache, for a sports injury, for an appendicitis, for a car crash, 40% of those kids report that they've been in a physical fight in the past year. Those kids are also at tremendously higher risk of future firearm injury, future other physical fights, and again, future depression um, and other mental health problems including, and behavioral health problems, including substance use disorder. We don't have adequate workforce in the emergency department. So although we know that there are interventions that can work to break that cycle of violence, we don't have staff to either screen or intervene. So over a number of years, we developed a program in partnership with youth and their parents that was both a small brief intervention delivered um, by a trained uh, research assistant that can theoretically someday be replicated uh, remotely um, and a fully automated two-way text messaging program to provide conflict resolution skills, some cognitive and behavioral therapeutic skills uh, underlying a, a larger um, kind of motivational interviewing uh, framework. Um, we did a pilot study which showed a significant improvement in depressive symptoms and a reduction in physical fear violence among those youth who were more symptomatic at the time of uh, enrollment in the study. We also saw that looking at kids' daily responses to this automated text message program, you could clearly identify by day seven which kids were more likely to get better and which kids were not likely to get better. Based on this, um, we applied for and received funding from NICHD to conduct an 800-person randomized control trial. 
that also includes some component of live interactions with a counselor. Um, I think as has been true for all of us over the course of COVID, we were doing great in terms of recruitment and then the past two years have been a bit tough um, for a number of reasons. So we are unlikely to make it to the full 800 youth, um, but we do have tremendous uh, diversity in terms of gender, um, race, ethnicity, and gender minorities, uh, sexual and gender minority status. So hopeful that we'll be able to find outcomes there. Stay tuned. So that's one example, using uh, technology augmentation to deliver interventions that have a theoretical and an evidence basis in other settings, in this emergency department setting, where I know that I'm going to be seeing higher risk kids. In the process of developing IDOV, we also noted what I've already mentioned, right, which is that sexual and gender minority youth are more likely um, to both uh, identify that they've been victims of bullying, both physical and online, less likely to have, um, particularly for those who are in smaller, more rural areas, less likely to have peer groups, and more likely to be suffering from mental health problems. We also found over the course of the study that an increasing percentage of youth that we were interacting with were reporting cyberbullying, um, up to around 50% of the youth that we were um, working with. So we developed um, with NICHD funding and then with funding from um, University of Wisconsin, um, a similar program to IDOV, but this one was now developed, delivered entirely online. So it allowed us to identify youth who identified um, having been victims of cyberbullying, enroll them remotely, deliver a purely remote, very brief motivational interviewing intervention, and then engage them in a daily uh, automated app um, that delivered many of those same skills around CBT, MI, et cetera, but also included a bystander intervention component. Because one of the things that I've heard and that cyberbullying researchers across the country have heard um, is that kids have, understandably, uh, are kind of unable to stand up for themselves. So it really comes to bystanders to kind of help diffuse um, a cyberbullying incident. And so we worked in developing, putting this um, into our intervention as well. Um, here's some screenshots of how we recruit kids um, on Instagram, what the daily check-ins look like. And then there's this element of on-demand uh, intervention as well. We did a small randomized control trial of this program. And although it did not decrease the number of cyber victimization episodes, um, we did find that it improved uh, self-reported coping methods used if youth were cyber victimized, increased the intention to intervene, improved well-being and self-reported psychological stress among those who received the intervention versus those who didn't, um, and then decreased the number of physical fights at the eight-week period. I should note that we did this study just about the time that COVID happened. So my 16-week results may be a bit biased by the fact that by the time we got to 16 weeks, a significant percentage of our youth were then um, not necessarily fully interacting with the world the way that they had typically done so. The fact that I saw improved well-being and stress among the kids that had participated in the intervention compared to those who didn't despite the fact that by that point many if not all of these children were um, in uh, out of in-person school, um, I think was particularly um, remarkable. And to me really highlights the fact that we can get at these syndemics using relatively low tech, relatively low touch tools. One of the things that we've heard over and over from kids in these studies, both IDOV and IMPACT at the close is this sense that it was just so nice to have someone check in who was not a member of their peer group, who was not a family member, they knew it was a robot, they knew it was automated, but it still made them feel cared for. Uh, whether that's an actual intervention effect or not, we can debate at the end, um, and I would love to hear people's opinions, um, but, but says to me again, the fact that social media or technology can be used for good, and we need to have adults looking out for these kids. Um, a third example of a study that is that individual focus, but with that kind of larger lens is um, a R01 that's recently launched with funding from NIDA, um, where we're using similar approaches um, to provide peer support um, to people in recovery from opioid use disorder. Uh, the study is being conducted in collaboration between Brown um, and colleagues at University of Indiana. We're using social media, again, to recruit people um, in recovery nationwide. Um, and then examining how this kind of mobile peer support application um, can help to provide support. 
way too early for me to provide any data, but worth mentioning as we talk about syndemics and the fact that opioid use disorder so often goes along with low recovery capital, low sense of well being, um, depression, anxiety, right? And so many of these folks are exposed to um, violence, whether domestic violence, physical peer violence, or a history of familial violence. Finding different ways to start to get at those underlying problems and change them um, matters deeply. Okay, but those are all individual level interventions, right? And so here I am talking about social ecological model, about relationships and community and society. And yet I'm telling you all about these one-on-one -on -one digital interventions to reduce mental illness, to reduce exposure to violence, to help support people in recovery from opioid use disorder. Like Megan, where's the rest of it? So let me talk a little bit about ways in which I think about larger relationship, community, and society level interventions to reduce violence, including firearm injury, to improve mental health, and to reduce um, substance use disorder. As I go into this part of the discussion, I need to acknowledge, of course, that firearms are tremendous, as we talk about societal factors, um, firearms are uh, tremendously prevalent and easily accessible um, within the United States. There are about 400 million firearms in private hands across the United States. Um, about 40% of households, including 40% of physician households, um, have a firearm. Um, the average gun owner owns about five firearms, mostly handguns. And there are about 50,000 gun deaths um, per year right now. That number is far too high. Certainly access to a firearm increases risk of firearm death in the home. But, and there are also a lot of protective factors that can be put in place. We cannot wish away those 400 million firearms and applying that same harm reduction model, that same four-step public health model to firearm injury reduction is going to have a hot, far greater likelihood of success, just as it did for cars, then pretending that we can somehow just wish that there were no firearms because that's not happening. That's not the reality of our communities. Um, that's not the reality of the United States. At the same time that I say that, that we have to kind of acknowledge the fact that part of our uh, societal approach to firearm injury has to acknowledge um, the number of firearms that are in homes in the US. I don't want to imply that paying attention to those other factors is sufficient, but to the non-firearm factors is in and of itself sufficient. Um, this is from a paper that was published in Health Affairs a few years ago that estimated the impact of increased behavioral health workforce on firearm suicide. And their big point was that the access to mental health care is actually not the determining factor in whether or not someone um, dies of firearm suicide it's easy access to a firearm at a moment of crisis um, and a moment of uh, overwhelming suicidal thoughts, impulsivity, and hopelessness. Um, a 10% increase in your behavioral health workforce is only going to correlate with a 1.2% decrease in firearm suicide. And oh my goodness, getting a 10% increase in our behavioral health workforce today feels just as impossible um, as, as some of the things that I'll talk about around firearms. As I talk about this kind of larger social ecological model, the larger community and societal effects on these syndemics of violence, mental illness, um, and uh, substance use disorder, I also want to acknowledge in this graph, or this um, kind of screenshot comes from the Surgeon General's very recent report on loneliness, um, that there is this other part of the syndemic, which we often don't talk about, which is connection and loneliness. Um, we've seen a dramatic increase in social isolation, a dramatic decrease in social engagement with friends or non-household family members, um, and, a, and a decrease in overall companionship um, among Americans across the United States. This to me, and I know to the Surgeon General, may serve as part of the underlying connection, you know, all of us in public health learn kind of the old, um, apocryphal story about thinking that coffee and lung cancer were linked when actually it was cigarettes, which people were more likely to smoke when they were drinking coffee, right? It was cigarettes that were actually the proximal cause or, or the direct cause of, um, of lung cancer. And uh, coffee was just a kind of a in-between um, factor that we happened to measure. 
many of us think that it is this social connection and social isolation or loneliness that may actually be the true mechanistic driver of so many of these syndemics. But that's a little bit of a hypothesis right now. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of how we're trying to answer that. Finally, as I talk about these syndemics, I need to acknowledge that intersection between mental health and firearm injury, not just around the behavioral workforce, behavioral health workforce, but also around so much of um, kind of media coverage and political talking points about how we decrease firearm injury in the United States. I wanna be super clear that there is a link between mental illness and firearm death when it comes to suicide, right? Two thirds of firearm deaths in this country are suicides and there is obviously an inextricable link between suicide, completed suicide and being mentally ill. But again, it's not a one-to-one -one link. Mental illness treatment alone does not decrease suicide. Moreover, for mass shootings, that link becomes even weaker. We know that people who commit mass shootings, which are only about 1%, depending on how you count it, one to 2% of deaths in the United States in any given year, um, people who commit mass shootings, we want to call them crazy. We want to believe that someone has to be mentally ill. There's certainly some sort of pathology which leads someone to do this. But what we find is that actually one of the biggest correlates of being a mass shooter is a prior criminal history, particularly a prior history of violence. We find that there are often um, threats and warning signs ahead of time. Mental illness, there's a slightly higher rate than average, um, but not significant, but not majorly so. And so I want us to disentangle that discussion. It's not to say that it's a non-existent correlation, um, but it's not as strong as many make it out to be. And this is an area that we need a lot more research into. Um, I give kudos to the folks at the Violence Project who've created a data set um, of mass shooters um, and, and have examined many of the characteristics. I recommend going to the Violence Project website if you're interested in more. Okay, so if I then take that kind of larger community and societal um, approach to prevention of these syndemics, how do we actually do that in reality? I'm going to talk here about a couple of studies that I'm involved in and then close with um, some comments about some larger studies that are ongoing that I'm tremendously hopeful about. Um, this is an R01 that I was fortunate to have funded by the CDC in that first tranche um, of funding um, from uh, in 2020. Um, we call it Guardians for Health. Um, it's a partnership between my colleagues um, at Brown and uh, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is part of 4-H. When I talk about community and community connection, to me, organizations like 4-H are the linchpin of how we create that. Big brothers, big sisters, boys and girls clubs, Girl Scouts can also be great exemplars. But 4-H has a tremendous um, data-supported uh, history of creating community of kids who participate in 4-H having better educational outcomes, health outcomes, leadership outcomes, injury outcomes than kids who don't participate in 4-H um, on a community basis. The shooting sports clubs are part of 4-H. Um, prior to the pandemic, they were present in all 50 states, um, had hundreds of thousands of youth enrolled, and taught kids age 8 through 17 how to safely handle a firearm for the purpose of shooting sports and hunting. It taught respect for a firearm, it taught um, some awareness of unintentional injury prevention, and has great stats as a um, uh, kind of as a program in terms of the outcomes of the kids who are actually in the program. But, and knowing that these youth are more likely than the average youth in the United States to live in a household with a firearm, certainly generally live in communities with higher than average levels of firearm ownership. There's also this larger perspective of, you know, how do we help these youth to be aware of not just risk factors for unintentional firearm injury, but also all these other types of violence and injury that I've just spent the last half hour talking about. How do we empower these youth, but also these larger communities to help recognize risk and act on it? So we've worked with 4-H over the past couple of years to put together a three-part curriculum based off of the bystander intervention model. This curriculum is ostensibly for the youth in 4-H shooting sports, but we also give parents the option of participating and of course the 4-H shooting sports instructors. Um, and it includes awareness of uh, knowledge, 
um, the ability to label risks, the ability to take responsibility for acting and knowing the skills to act and then giving them actual things that they can do. Um, and we're in the midst of the study. We've enrolled 4-H shooting sports communities um, in states across the US. Um, we have 47 different sites enrolled right now and are in the process of measuring both proximal internal changes, behavioral changes, and then distal community level outcomes. Um, so fingers crossed um, that we do show that community level intervention. But to me, something that's so key about this project as opposed to my other projects is that it is embedded in the community, in those community organizations, which gets it so many of those, again, proximal drivers of these syndemics. Another study, which I'm thrilled to be part of, um, I am MPIing with Dr. Nicole Nugent, who's also here at Brown, um, going back to that question of what is really kids' experience with social media versus loneliness versus violence? We were funded by NICHD to examine longitudinally the intersection between kids' online social media use, their in-person interactions um, recorded by a little um, device um, developed and in, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Matias Mel from University of Arizona that measures little snippets of audio conversations and then self-reported personal experiences. We do ecological momentary um, assessments as well as some kind of longitudinal survey reported outcomes. The idea being that we can, by capturing these three different data sources and then looking at correlations with loneliness, peer support, um, uh, some kind of high level measures um, of uh, mental distress, depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, um, and uh, measures of violence exposure can start to kind of disentangle or, or create um, kind of a more accurate um, descriptive model um, of the ways in which these various syndemics um, intersect. Um, again, we do this combo of EMA, the ear, and then uh, some extraction of online social networking, thanks to my computer science colleagues here at Brown. Um, we're going to be looking at the features or are actively looking at um, signatures of social connection and isolation, including the content of interactions, the frequency of interactions, the type of interactions, the number of connections, and so on. And then again, looking at that kind of three-part intersection between peer victimization, social connection and isolation, and psychological well-being, while accounting for those moderators and mediators um, of, of these entities. Here's an example from Nicole Nugent's um, prior grants using EMA and OSN, where she's able to track um, both uh, on the top, you can see um, some of the audio um, snippets that, that you're able to hear. Um, in the middle, you can see the ecological momentary assessments about whether they're sad, lonely, bored, or hopeless. You can see some comments around triggers, um, such as using substances. Um, this was a study of kids um, who had recently been hospitalized for suicidal ideation, so things like cutting. Um, and then uh, at the bottom, kind of correlating with um, online social networking messages. And you can see how this allows us to have a richer conception of what's actually going on in these teens' lives than we have um, by just examining post hoc data about self-reported frequency of Facebook use, which is to totally useless because it doesn't actually get at what kids are looking at, how long they're spending on it, how they're interacting with it, what their um, peer group looks like, et cetera. So I'm very hopeful that this study will provide us some answers. Um, again, as with all studies, COVID put a little bit of a crimp in our ability to recruit, particularly given that we're not recruiting kids that are there with acute psychiatric crises, which do make up such a big percentage of our um, volume um, in the emergency department, but stay tuned um, for further details. I should mention as I get towards the end of my time, um, and I can talk more about this afterwards, we are using um, some neat uh, NLP modeling um, with um, my CS colleagues to help us um, label uh, these um, online social networking and ear messages. So stay tuned on that as well, because it's just a huge task. I've done qualitative coding of them in the past, hand coding, and it's a lot of work. So if we're gonna do this on a, on a on scale, we've got to figure out computerized models um, for recognizing um, patterns of peer victimization, violence, loneliness, et cetera. All right, so onward to some of the stuff that other folks are doing. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Megan Moreno and her team at University of Wisconsin, who recently got a PO1 funded. I'm fortunate to get to collaborate with Ellen Selke, who's uh, leading one of the three projects. 
looking at um, brain behavior and well-being among youth. Um, this is, again, like the project that I just described, a really exciting um, opportunity for us to examine how technology and digital media actually impact kids' behaviors, as well as their mental well-being. Um, I want to mention the FACTS Consortium, which was funded by NICHD um, about six years ago, um, run primarily out of University of Michigan, but with investigators um, from across the country. Um, we work to try to restart the science of firearm injury prevention among adolescents, children, and teens. And so many of the people in this picture now have R01 funding around firearm injury, really restarting a field that had been abandoned for too long. Um, there are folks who are doing work around that individual provider level screening and counseling, certainly for violence. We've talked, you know, I can talk about partner violence and cyberbullying, but also around firearm injury. This screenshot comes from the Bullet Points Project run out of UC Davis, um, which I recommend folks to refer to if you're looking for information to use in your own healthcare setting. Data on its efficacy still TBD, but there's some promising preliminary data from some folks across the country. There's violence intervention programs. If I talk about addressing syndemics, I have to talk about the syndemic of structural racism and economic disempowerment, which leads kids, particularly black and brown youth, to so often end up in my emergency department as a victim of a um, blunt assault, shooting, or stabbing. There are a number of really great violence intervention programs that are based both in the community and at hospitals nationwide. There's a dearth of evidence. There's some promising preliminary evidence about these wraparound programs ability to address those underlying mental illness, substance use disorder, economic, educational factors that led to someone being hurt in the first place. And that by addressing all of those, there is some promising evidence that it then decreases recurrent violent injury. But so much more is needed. This is a picture of the Life Outside of Violence program based um, in St. Louis, the woman on the left, Kristen Mueller, um, recently got her K-23 funded by NIMHD um, to look at uh, community um, it, kind of community empowerment models and to examine how we can better engage um, and retain um, injured patients in these programs and then evaluate their outcomes. Um, and at the top right, I have a picture of the Nonviolence Institute, which is that community-based um, violence intervention program um, that I work with here in Providence, Rhode Island. There are similar programs, of course, across the country. There's some neat work. Oh, and I didn't put the, um, uh, the citation on here, but there's some really great work funded by NIH looking at ways to improve access to safe storage for those 40% of households that have firearms and someone who is imminently at risk because of dementia, because they have grandkids visiting, because of suicide, finding ways for people to store their firearm out of the house safely and temporarily, and then get it back. This work is led by Emmy Betts at University of Colorado. And finally, there is just some brilliant work going on nationwide around that larger societal inter, um, interaction. Um, Gina South, who's a physician at University of Pennsylvania, Charlie Brannis um, at Columbia, and many others uh, have done some brilliant uh, research looking at the efficacy of greening vacant lots, so taking a vacant lot and putting a garden in, or taking an abandoned building and rehabbing it, and randomizing neighborhoods to either have that greening and rehabilitation versus not, and have shown that that environmental um, uh, intervention decreases rates of violence, stress, depression, gunshots um, in the community around where the gardens are planted and where the buildings are rehabbed. Um, so a, a very evidence-based version of that old broken windows hypothesis, but a way for us to address kind of those historical and structural factors, including racism that lead to that epidemic, syndemic of violence, mental illness, et cetera, that we are in. Um, lastly, as I close, I, I do want to acknowledge um, so many of my motivations for this work. As I've mentioned, I am a mom. That's certainly part of it. Jay Dickey on the left who passed the Dickey Amendment is part of the reason I almost didn't do this work because there was no funding for firearm injury prevention for a very long time. Um, I'm quite grateful that before he died, he realized that he should not have blocked firearm injury prevention research and actually did acknowledge that violence was a public health problem. I acknowledge the kids and teachers and Sandy Hook, um, as well as the hundreds of other youth and adults across the United States that lose their life every single day to firearm injury. I think Sandy Hook was part of what 
led many folks across the U.S. to start to care about firearm injury and violence as a mental health problem. Um, but it is far from, you know, that that was just a sadly um, a drop in the bucket. And on the right, um, Dr. Tamara O'Neill, um, a fellow emergency physician who was shot and killed as she left her shift in an emergency department in 2018 by her fiance. And I put her picture up because I know that this is personal for so many of us. And again, none of us are immune. So as we talk about addressing the syndemic as researchers, it's important for us to also remember the degree to which this affects so many within our community. And we should be so lucky as to not have it touch our own family but to remember that this is a lived experience that we are researching and that we have to come at this work with just a tremendous amount of humility um, and gratitude um, to the communities with which we work. I'll stop there. A big thank you to many, if not all of the people um, who I'm so privileged to get to work with across the United States, um, including my students and staff um, here at Brown, some of whom I hope to move to Yale with me uh, when I transition there in a month. Um, and I will let uh, Layla take it away for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Annie. That was just an amazing talk. And I can always um, tell how amazing it is by how many questions are coming in. So we're not going to get to finish all of them, but I'm definitely going to um, go through the Q&A and ask you some of them. Um, so for the Q&A, if you do have a question or a comment, you can put it in the Q&A section of Zoom at the bottom of your screen, type in and hit send. And you also have the option to like questions so that we don't duplicate posts. And the most like questions rise to the top. So that's where I'm going to start. Um, so with the proliferation of AI into our lives today, do you see a role for AI in helping us resolve firearm violence? Tech Ooh. augmentation assumes that people have access to tech. How do you deal with the digital divide that exists, especially for rural areas, native communities, and low-income and poor ur urban communities? So. I'm going to give you a whopper to start with, but yeah, is AI, so is AI got, the solution? I've got eight minutes, right? <laughs> and, um, so and, for, 19 and 19 more questions. <laughs> yeah, we're not happy to chat more later. But so, so for AI, yes, absolutely. I think I mentioned a little bit how I'm actually trying to use AI to try to develop signatures to be able to identify those interactions that signify violence. There is so much work to be done around AI, both in terms of utilizing it to identify those predictors, but also how to use it to intervene and then how to moderate those very real privacy and ethical concerns. Something I didn't mention in this talk is that I am unfortunately getting increasing rates of refusal for participation in studies and people are citing the news around concern, these privacy concerns. Um, and so it's something that I think we need to grapple with as researchers, AI is great. And there's kind of this whole other side to it that we deeply need to address. Um, but I think it has great potential and would love to see other folks um, kind of doing work there. In terms of the digital divide, this is something that I think about every day. Um, it's part of the reason that so much of my work uses text messaging rather than more advanced forms of digital technology. Um, everyone in the US has text messaging. And I've done studies showing that regardless of the socioeconomic status, age, um, literacy level, et cetera, everyone's got texting. Additionally, now pretty much everyone, especially if we're looking at young adults and adolescents, pretty much everyone has a smartphone, Wi-Fi access and broadband does start to divide according to socioeconomic status, geography, disability status as well. Um, and so I try to pay attention to it in terms of the types of interventions I create. Um, I'm not creating things for wearables um, for the most part because those are out of reach of my patient populations that I work with and care about. Um, not to say these don't matter because we're seeing dissemination of wearables. Um, but I try to make sure that, for example, if I develop an app, it can be downloaded and it can work offline. So it doesn't require active Wi-Fi, um, cellular or broadband uh, access. I also think when we think about digital divide, it's super important for us to make sure that we're designing in a mobile friendly way. There's lots and lots of data about, again, that high access to smartphones and about the very disparate access to laptops. We saw this with COVID vaccine delivery, um, with the disparities in signups for COVID vaccines. So many of those state websites for vaccines were designed for laptops or desktops. Um, there were uh, folks that developed text message programs for vaccine sign up instead, and those saw much greater um, diversity, um, equity. Oh, 
sorry, my wearable is talking to me, diversity, equity, and inclusion in terms of um, uh, race, ethnicity, um, socioeconomic status of those who signed up. So that's a design question to me, as well as, of course, advocating for improved access to broadband and cellular technology for those across the US. Great, okay, so the next most popular question, can you speak more about what interventions you think are needed or are ideal to mitigate the pervasive firearm violence in rural counties, including Native American sovereign nations? So I'm hopeful that things like Guardians for Health will be helpful. Um, I think there really is, if, if I do this, you know, if I step away from social and ecological model, if I go to, you know, theory of reasoned action or COMB, um, I know that knowledge and education is like, has the lowest effect size of any type of intervention, but really kind of that knowledge and normative change is something that is so, so deeply needed. Normative change around beliefs, around safe storage normative change around understanding that when folks are depressed, drunk, suicidal, they should not have access to a firearm. Um, normative change around, honestly, letting everyone have access to a firearm regardless of those risk factors. Um, there are also larger, again, environmental or structural changes. When I talk to people, whether in rural counties or in urban counties, the reason that they all own a firearm is to protect themselves. And so if we want to change that access to a firearm in that moment of impulsivity or hopelessness or hatred, we have to talk about the reason that someone chooses to purchase a firearm in the first place, which is helping to make, and, and that's about helping to make people feel safe, um, which is a much bigger project than NIH can take on, um, but is something, it's one of the reasons I'm going to go become a dean is because I think there's a lot of work across all of public health and the healthcare system, um, as well as society for us to do. Fantastic. Okay. Um, he here's a question that we'll see how you feel about the answer. So what is the root cause of violence? Is it hmm. firearm possession or is it mental health? Can restricting firearm possession truly reduce violent death or just change the means of violence? Too often we hear about the blame on firearm possession, but too little attention is given to mental health problems. I know you you, you addressed a little bit of this um, in, the, in the beginning of your talk, but if you wanna say a few more words, that would be great. A absolutely, and um, I'm just looking to see if I put an extra slide in here around policies. So there's certainly some legislation that makes a difference. Um, for sure, there you know, there are times where reducing access to a firearm does save lives. So you know, with suicide, 90% of suicide attempts with a firearm are fatal versus only 10% of suicide attempts by another means. If someone survives a suicide attempt, they almost never go on um, to die of suicide. We can save them, we can get them in treatment, not zero, right? It's not a, it's not a zero rate, but a large percentage of the folks um, who do survive a first attempt um, don't go on and, and have a second fatal attempt. Um, so, so reducing that access to lethal means at that moment of crisis can have a huge impact. That said, it's not all about the gun. It is also about all of those proximal factors. You know, what is it that makes a guy open his door and decide to shoot a young man that ring the wrong doorbell? Let's talk about not that that was not just about the firearm, right? Um, it is not just about a firearm that, um, right? So there, there's a whole other suite of, and I could go on with examples, but for the sake of time, I won't. There's a whole group of other drivers, again, with fear being one of those underlying ones, lack of conflict resolution, isolation, the assumption of the worst about the person who is coming up to us. All of that plays into it. And I totally agree that demonizing firearm ownership and demonizing firearm owners is the wrong way to get a handle on this epidemic, just as demonizing substance users, demonizing uh, people who drive a car, demonizing people who like to go out to dinner, right? None of that works for us to handle public health epidemics. We've got to look at those proximal causes as well as the distal ones. Great. Um, and I know that we're about a minute till our close. So I do want to allow um, for some closing remarks from the OBSSR um, Deputy Director. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Esposito, for moderating uh, the question and answer session. And thank you, Dr. Rennie, for your excellent presentation.
um, it was very comprehensive. I also want to thank everyone who joined online today. And if you have colleagues who are unable to join but might be interested, um, please remind them that this is going to be recorded or it has been recorded. It's going to be available in about a month. The next OBSSR director webinar is going to be Tuesday, September 19th. It'll feature Dr. Neil A. Lewis, Jr. of Cornell University, who will present on social influence, policy, economics, and communication. Please subscribe to our listserv if you'd like updates and more information. And that concludes today's webinar. I want to thank again our speaker, Dr. Rani, and for all of you for attending, and hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you again.